Super Ed, welcome to your weekly success coaching session. I want to make you more successful. Tell me what's going on. How can I help you get more success, buddy? Uh, so right now, it's, it's a little bit different from coaching. There's more on, on like my personal, uh, what's going on, right? And how the market shift is kind of affecting the way I'm trying to get business. So I've noticed that, you know, a lot of my clients that I had that were in the 200, 300 price point are getting priced out because of the interest rates or they don't qualify anymore. Uh, a good example is that DR Horton deal, the house isn't going to be done until June. They couldn't lock in a rate. So it went from 3.75 to like 4.5, 4.7. Like we still don't know. So it's just dealing with that obviously is a challenge. And then uh, just keeping buyers motivated. I guess I do have about, I would say four active buyers that I'm working right now. And it's kind of the same, the same situation with all of them, right? So is your objection roadblock is how do you handle objection of interest rate increases? Is that what you're... I guess how to keep them mo motivated to not give up. Okay. You know? So you want to discuss about how do you keep clients motivated if the interest rates are going up? Yeah. That's what you want to discuss today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me ask you this. You mentioned you have four or five clients when the same board of prices going up or affordability being impacted based on increase the interest rate. Correct? Yeah. How many clients do you have in all that you're working with? So those are my active ones passively where, you know, I follow up here and there, maybe like another three or four. Okay. So four active and four passive, these four active plans, they're all in the same price range. Uh, pretty close. Yeah. Like 250 to three, 330, like kind of that. Okay. That so, range. so you, what you're saying is when they're looking to buy and go home in the four, 300 price range, based on increase in interest rate, they actually are getting priced out. Okay? Yeah, we have to either drop the price. Are all these buyers looking to buy a resale home or new construction homes? A little bit of both. So the ones that want to do new construction is even harder because that price point is gone. Um, you know, 250 doesn't exist anymore uh, for new construction. So it's just, you know, kind of going into resale. And then if we go into resale, it's dealing with having more funds to be able to compete. Understood. So what's the common objection getting to, from these clients? It's, it's what they want to buy is uh, going to be less of a home or are they saying they don't want to buy a home at all? What are they saying to you? Uh, so right now it's kind of in the middle where they don't know yet. And that's why I'm kind of here for, for guidance to find out what I can do or say, or what's the best advice for them. Cause they don't know if like, Hey, well, maybe we just can't buy right now, you know, based on what we want. Or if we go into resale, we don't have the extra money to win an offer, you know? Understood. Understood. Why don't we do this? Let's let's do role playing right now, okay? Where I'll be Ed, I'll be the realtor. You are the buyer. So throw at, throw at me all the objections that they throw at you: interest rate, affordability, whatever. And we'll evaluate how you can improve your script dialogue with them. Fair enough? Yeah. So Ed, I know you've been looking to buying a home, but you don't run my phone calls, man. Stop answering my phone call. What's going on with that? You not want to buy a home now? <laughs> no, I still want to buy. It's just, you know, the interest rate scared me. And uh, I don't think we can afford the house we wanted uh, before. So. Uh, I know, Ed, you mentioned to me that you and your wife have been leasing a home for the last three years. Four years. How long has it been? Three and a half. Three and a half years. And I know I met you a few months back. We said you were ready to buy a home. Three months yeah. back, when he said you were ready to buy a home, what prompted you to make that decision? I just felt a little tight in the apartment, needed more space. And, uh, you know, we're trying to, to upgrade to more space. And remind me again, how much rent are you paying right now, Ed? Right now we're paying about 17, 1700 1700 So you said it was, it was too small, so you want a bigger space. And that's why you said you would buy a home. But why not just rent a bigger apartment, Ed? Because, you know, we want to own our own house. Uh, that's kind of the goal. Why is home ownership important to you? Uh, just because, you know, when, when we're paying rent, we're paying to a landlord, never see that back. With a house, I've heard that it's a good investment, so I wanna set myself up for the future. And so you see the value of home ownership. So then why aren't you returning my phone calls? Why are you putting home ownership on a pause? I don't know, because the rates went up and you know people are saying there's a crash or a bubble, so I don't know. You know we're scared, but you know, fair. you don't know what so, to believe right now. Fair, so interest rates is a concern and you also feel the market is gonna bust, it's a bubble. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to share my perspective with you. Which one do you want me to answer first for you? I guess the, the bubble one. 
the bubble. Yeah. So do you know when the last bubble we had in the US market, Ed? 2006 to 2008, kind of, Fair. Kind of whole thing happened. And do you know what caused that bubble? Not really. Okay. Have you heard the term deregulation? Mm -hmm. So back in the day, Ed, if I had to get a home loan, whether I was buying it as my primary home, investment home, or my secondary home, I could just tell the bank, state my income and get a loan. They used to call these stated income loans. No doc loans, no document loans. Just tell the bank, tell the lender, I make this much money, I have this much debt, and they will give you a loan. It was super easy to get a loan. Now you tell me, Ed, if it's easy to get a loan versus hard to get a loan, in which aspect would you get more unqualified buyers buying homes? What is you regulated, right? Yeah. Right now, it's completely upside down, complete different from what it was back in 2006, 2008. Here, even if I'm a qualified buyer with the best credit score, with, le with least amount of debt, it takes a lot of back and forth, a lot of documentation, a lot of detail to qualify for the loan, which means today there are more qualified buyers buying homes than what we had in 2006, 2007, 2008. So what happens in the market is when there's artificial inflation, it leads to the prices going up. And at some point in time, buyers say, you know what, I can't afford the home. Do you understand the concept of refinancing it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you understand the concept of appraisal? Yeah. Man, are you a buyer or a realtor? You know a lot about this. Uh, you know, my, my mom used to be a realtor in the uh, 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom used to be a realtor? Yeah. Man, can you pretend that you know nothing, man? So I, can I don't know what it. that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me give you a perspective about, you know, what appraisal, what refinances. Let's just say I buy a home today for $400,000 and have a loan against the home. Okay. Then after six months, I refinance the home. I go to another bank and say, you know what? My home I bought was for 400, but today my home is worth 600 and give me a loan against that. Then they will do a cash out refinance. Okay. So let me run some numbers for you. I buy a home for $400,000. With 20% down, I put on $80,000. My loan amount is 320. Are you good with me so far? After six months, I say, now the home's value is $500,000, $600,000. I still owe 320. Now my loan was approved for $500,000, let's just say, okay? Now I owe 320, then the balance, the difference, I will take the money out. That's called cash out refinance, okay? Cash out refinances caused a big issue back in 2006, 2007, 2008, where a lot of people are buying homes, values going up, pulling money out and refinancing it. Now, if the market shifts and they want to sell the home for 600 and the home does not sell for 600, then what happens? Now they owe $500,000 for the borrowed against that home and they don't have that kind of money. Then they go into foreclosure. So there was actually a law passed that the lender cannot have influence or cannot pick the appraiser or appraisal company. They have to be third party. So no matter what lender you work with in today's market, they cannot cherry pick who's going to be the appraiser because they want independent analysis of the home. I'm giving examples why the market crashed back then. Yeah. So the bank could literally go down the street, find a buddy to do the appraisal, value comes higher, all they want to do was loans after loans after loans and charge all those fees to the buyer. Deregulation happened. Anyone could get a loan. So the market, the way it was back then to how it's today, it's completely different. It's very hard to get loans. Industry is regulated. Who does the appraisal, how they do it? I'll pause there. Is this making sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So my perspective is this, Ed. Yes, markets do crash. Markets do collapse. But it happens when there is artificial inflation. When there is, when there is, you know, you no know, demand and supply is an imbalance. Okay. Now you live in Texas, my friend. You live in Houston. Okay. Let me tell you why Houston is a very protected economy, protective market. Okay. After the 2007-8 housing crash, the big crash that happened was in the oil and gas industry. That happened in 2014. You know, oil prices went from you know high 
uh, 80, 90, 100 dollars a barrel to down to 25, 30 dollars a barrel, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, Houston is considered the oil gas capital of the world. A lot of people lost job, people were laid off. But guess what? At the end of 2014, we had net job additions instead of job loss in the Houston market because other economies are in Houston. Your oil and gas market is great. Also the medical center, the shipping port. So what I'm gonna to demonstrate to you is this housing market, it may get, it may correct itself. The demand supply would get corrected. The price increase, which are double digit now, may get down to you know, single digits, but the price is not gonna go from here to down there. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, so you're saying it's gonna stabilize, but it's not gonna crash. Yeah, the other aspect about Houston market ed is, that it's controlled by new developments, by builders, okay? In all around Houston, we have neighborhoods that are developed by builders. When they open new section back in the day, they would say, we have 20 lots for sale. If there are 20 buyers, they'll sell 20 homes in a day. When a buyer writes a contract, they will give some amount of incentive towards design center to improve the home, make the home better. Then fast forward to 2021, 2022. Now the builders say, we have 20 home sites opening today. We're only gonna sell three home sites today. Come back next month and get in line. And while you're waiting in line, we're gonna raise the prices by 5%, $5,000, $10,000. So they are squeezing the supply of homes in the market. And their reasoning is also different because lumber prices keep fluctuating. Last year, they had a huge spike in lumber prices. Q4, they adjusted and normalized. Q1 of this year, they've gone up again. So the builder commits to selling home to a buyer for a certain price range, and the price of lumber goes up. Now, guess what's impacted? The profit margin. All these builders build for profit. So to answer your initial question, are we in a bubble? Is it going to bust? Answer is no. Is the market going to adjust? Absolutely yes. So what will happen, Ed, in the next few months, next six months, Projections are the interest rates are going to keep ticking up a quarter point every few months. We already had a few so far. When that happens, the builders will have to adjust their pricing. And what I mean by pricing is the base price is going to stay where it's at. Now they will say, you know what? I'm going to give you $10,000 incentive to spend at my design center where I have additional profit margin to improve the home. Historically speaking, in our market, builders, when they raise a base price, they don't, they don't bring it down. The second thing, what they would consider doing is adding more features to the home. As an example, most homes that are built new, in the laundry room, they have for the dryer, a gas line, okay? Back in the day, it used to be a standard feature. The laundry, would, laundry room would come with a gas line to, to give the homeowner an option. Now they say pay us four or $500 to add the gas line in there. So when they wanna make more money, they de-feature the home and make these as an add-on expense. Builders offer gutters in the front instead of gutters all around, sprinkler yeah. system. So they de-feature them. Now, when the market shifts in the buyer's favor, they say, you know what, actually, now when you buy the home for the same price, we're gonna include the gutters. We're gonna include the sprinkler system. Or you know what, we'll include a washer dry fridge, but the value of the home is still gonna hold <laughs> steady, okay? So my suggestion to you is this, if you were sitting in a different market other than Houston, yes, I would be concerned about bubble market, all that stuff. For example, if you go to Austin, the market is at a very peak increase every day. And that's because yeah. of company like, like Tesla moving over there. Now that's not sustainable, at some point then they will peak and reach a certain market value. Houston is not driven by one economy or one thing, oil and gas, medical center, shipping port, all the industry moving over here. That's, it's, that's keeping our economy up. So I'm an expert in, in this industry, Ed. I have been in this business for many, many years, done tons and tons of transactions. I've been in the ups and downs. My projections are we are not in the bubble. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes I sense. I gave you a very long answer and a plan may not have as much time to listen to it. Now you can take data points, what I shared with you and apply it to them. Right? Yeah, yeah. But you basically have all of this data, what I shared with you, and you have this recording as well. And then you can use snippets of that to handle objection or bubble. Does that make sense? Was that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Your first objection was interest rate rising. Now, when I was engaging with you, I asked you a lot of questions, like what made you think that you should buy a home back then? 
You said, yeah. I want a bigger home. Well, I don't want to pay somebody else's mortgage. So I'm going to go back to that now, okay? Okay. So like you're saying that you've been leasing for the last three years, paying $1,700. You want more space, growing family, but you don't want to get a bigger apartment because you're throwing away money. So you believe in home ownership, but then you want to take a back seat and say, you know what? Let me not buy a home now because interest rates are rising. Is that the objection, Ed? Yes. So which means that you're going to re renew the lease for another year, correct? I'll probably have I would, to, yeah. What I would do is I would pull up the phone and tell them, you're paying $1,700 right now? I can bet you this. I'm, I'm sure you got to notice your rent is going up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just take, it's going up to 1850. 1850 times 12, that's $22,000. So for this year, 22 to 23, you will spend $22,000 in rent. On the other hand, if the interest rate was 3.75, when you started working with me, and today it's at 4.75, a 1% increase, let's just say by the time you find the home, it goes up by another half a percent. So increase of 1.5%. That seems a significant increase in the interest rate. Now, if you amortize a loan for 30 years, Ed, if you buy them for $300,000, what you would pay in interest in 30 years based on 3.75 versus uh, you know, 5% as an example, would be a few $100,000 more over 30 years. But here's a true stat about the US market. Most people don't live in the home for 30 years. They move within five to seven years of moving into the home. And that's what I project for you. You live in an apartment for three, three years, now you're moving, you want to live in a bigger home, bigger apartment. Yeah. Anything is going to happen. So while it may seem that getting a high interest rate is going to cost a lot more money, but let's look at it objectively. Every month, if your monthly payment was $2,000 based on 3.5 interest rate, if the interest rate goes to 5%, 1.5% increase, your monthly payment would go from $2,000 to approximately $2,150, okay? It'll go about $100 to $200 approximately. Even if it goes about $200 a month, which is not going to be the case, that would mean you spend $2,400 a year more in interest. Yeah. Okay? In 10 years, you would have spent $24,000, correct? 2,100 yeah. times 10 years, 24,000. We just did the math, correct? Based on the rent that you're paying, you're gonna waste $22,000 approximately in one year. Now, would you rather waste $22,000 in a year or waste $24,000 over 10 years? Yeah, 24,000. Right? Because money's gonna come out of your pocket regardless. Whether you pay higher interest rate or you pay higher amount in rent. So are you somebody who's looking short-term success or long-term success, Ed? You mentioned to me, you're growing a family, you're going to have some kids. Well, do you not want long-term success for your kids? Absolutely. Right? So home ownership is important, but also you got to look at the fact that continuing to lease your home, lease your apartment is going to give no leverage to you in no market condition. If you're concerned about a uh, four and a half or five percent interest rate, fast forward 2024. Let's just say you wait for two years. If the interest rate goes to seven percent, would you look back and say, "Oh, I wish I got the rate of five percent"? Absolutely. And here's the crazy part, Ed: the rates that we have today, four and a half, five percent, they are relatively high to what we saw a year back or two years back during pandemic. But historically speaking when your parents or my parents or a generation before us, when they got their loans, 13%, 14%, 15% was the norm. Was the norm. Now, the generation that we are now we're used to 3% or 4%. So 5% means seems like, oh, it's so much more money. So I would highly recommend that you think about your home ownership as a long-term strategy. And even though the interest rates are going up, calculate how much extra dollar you'll pay a month versus what you would have paid had you bought the home three months back, four months back. If the difference is $100, $200, I would suggest making some lifestyle changes. Don't drink your coffee from Starbucks every day. Make your own coffee. Don't eat out lunch every day. Take your lunch to work. Is it yeah. making sense, Ed? 
Yeah, absolutely. What are your final thoughts? I think that's great. Kind of uh, trying to prioritize what's more important to me. And if it's home ownership, then that's what I have to do to, to get into a home. Right. And there are going to be clients, Ed, who are just stuck. You know what? I'm just going to wait. I don't want to buy. I'm going to wait it out. Not a problem, sir. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. You're not here to convince them or beg them to see a perspective. You're here to demonstrate value and share a knowledge base. Now, it's up to them. They want to take the lead and buy the home. Good for them. They don't want to buy a home. So what? Yeah. Next. Next. We have millions of people who live in Houston. If you have three or four clients, make that into 10x, find 40 clients. Somebody, somebody will listen to you and say, you know what, Ed, what you're saying is relevant. I believe what you're saying and I agree with you. I'm ready to buy a home. The guys who are stuck, there's a reason why they're leasing for three years. Maybe they're stuck in the loop of, oh, why have the headache? Why not call the apartment complex to fix the light bulb or fix the issue in the home? Yeah. So you have to hone in on home importance of home ownership. If you sell them on that concept, the values of that, and if they have kids, if they're family member, something to leave for the kids, leave for the family. That's why if you get them convinced on that, the roadblock of interest rate, so what? If they have a monthly budget that I can only afford to pay $2,000, I can pay $2,100, all right, not a problem. Are you willing to compromise to buy a smaller home? No, I want the same size home. Are you willing to compromise to live 20 minutes further away from your work? No, I want to live in the same area. Okay, so you're saying you want to live in the same area. You want to buy the same size home, but you want to pay that money. Here's what I'll do. I'll put you on the foreclosure list. And when a foreclosure comes, then you can buy that. But guess what? There are not going to be very many foreclosure homes coming on the market. Does that make sense? All right, have a nice day and buy. <laughs> I'm not yeah, going to keep... don't get it. That's okay. That's okay. They don't get it. Not a problem. Have a nice day. Okay. Have a nice day. See, the issue is, uh, is uh, that you overcommit in aligning yourself with them, with their needs, with the thought process. It should be the other way around. They should align themselves with your strategy, with your mindset, with your approach. And if they're not aligned, take them off your lane, put them away, put them on a drip campaign, spending time, effort, energy, and having the same role. Oh, Ed, I love the home. It's, it's exactly what I want, but it's too expensive. I don't want to buy. Well, maybe not ready, my friend. I'll come back to you in six months. When the same home is selling for $30,000 $30, more, then you regret your decision. Yeah. Four clients you mentioned, how long have you been working with them? For, I mean, two of them for a year. A year. The same people, they had an option of buying a home a year back, right? That, that trigger shy. That trigger yeah, shy. Yeah. Interest rate is now an excuse. They just need an excuse not to have a commitment in their life. If somebody was committed to buying a home and there's so many options in Houston, there's no reason why after a year, this should be still sitting around. You know what I mean? They're not motivated enough. So I think the problem is not the objection of interest rate. It's a problem of who you prospect and who you're working with. These clients are not motivated. Today's interest rate, tomorrow will be something else. Oh, it's summer break. I'm going on a vacation. Oh, it's Christmas time. I'm traveling. I can't yeah, move when it's Christmas time. That it's Thanksgiving. Sense. I got to get in line to buy the TV or Best Buy. I don't want to buy a home. People who have excuses, Ed, they will always have excuses. Something or the other will always be happening in their life. But if you speak objectively and be direct about what it is, and they still don't get it, the bags, move on to the next one. Okay. Is this making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Questions, thoughts, comments? I mean, that's kind of what, what it is. And then I have some questions also, but not coaching. That's something else. Um, and then, but I, that just changed the perspective that, you know, back to what you said that I'm maybe too nice. I overcommit to people that I want to help versus, hey, you see it, you see it. If you don't, you don't. Correct. You know, that's, that's what I need to work on.